You're tuned into the Writing Community Chat Show, the live streaming YouTube podcast that brings you the stories of authors, screenwriters, and more. Indie or established, this show's for the community, and we invite you to be a part of it. Head to the Writing Community Chat Show.com for more info. The WCCS, together as one, we get it done. Hello and welcome to the Writing Community Chat Show. Everybody and welcome to this week's Writing Community Chat Show. We are back for season 12. I can't believe it. Season 12 is here and it's fantastic. We're going to have some amazing familiar faces coming up this season and some brand new ones for you to learn all about and hear about their stories in the writing world. Chris Hooley is back with me. How are you doing, Chris? How have you been? Yeah, I'm very good. Thank you. How are you, Agat? Um, yeah, really good. Obviously, it's been two weeks since our last show. The gaps between the seasons really... You know what it's like. I mean, we, we step away from the show. We think we've been really busy, but suddenly we're back in and, and it's it's flown by and, and it's, it feels like we've never left in the, in the best way possible because we get to connect with this amazing community of writers that follow the show and all these brand new people in the chat. Hello to you all. Thank you for tuning in live. You know who's coming up on the show today. It's going to be fantastic. But obviously the Harrogate Crime Writers Festival was recently... Um, part of the show and I was there interviewing for Pan McMillan as well and interviewing their fantastic authors that was a brilliant experience as well so we're doing a lot of things with the show Chris um, and this season is going to be another great addition to what we're doing. No it definitely is and you know over 200 shows that we've done now we've had some of the best authors in the world on the show but I have never seen a reaction like we currently have um, with Jonathan. Oh, it's, it's incredible. Completely yeah it's, yeah, it's amazing. It, yeah, as you mentioned rightly, we've had uh, indie authors on this show telling their amazing stories. We've had the best authors in the world in terms of sales and uh, professionalism on the show. And there's not once been a reaction like we have tonight uh, because of the Lockwood Army. And I've called it the army out there and people have reacted to that because you are. You're a fantastic supporting group for this author. And we've never seen anything like it. And I think you should be very proud that you support authors in this way, because we know what it's like. We're both self-published authors and we work really hard uh, for the show and for our writing, as do every other author uh, people out there. And to have the support like you give, Jonathan, is just incredible and so rewarding to that author for, for working um, to, to, to just show the other comments coming in. Lockwood, how, how we are. How are we? Um, <laughs> just to show how supportive you are is, is really rewarding to an author. So thank you for doing that. And I know it's not to us, it's, it's to Jonathan, but you should be really proud of your, your army uh, standard there. And thank you, Ali, for saying that <laughs> army. Um, it's incredible. Uh, well done to you guys. It's brilliant. Yeah, it is. I mean, writing is a lonely business. It's the sitting in a room and, you know, you, you may just be there with a cup of tea and not knowing where your story's going and how many people are going to read it. So the fact that this many people are here tonight with us on a Friday to celebrate Jonathan and his writing is absolutely fantastic. And obviously we can't get, wait to get to speak to him. And I'm sure you're excited too. Um, stick around. Part three of the show is where you get to ask your questions. Um, and I'm sure you've got them in abundance. So please get them ready uh, for part three of the show. Uh, but we're going to speak to Jonathan before that. We're going to introduce him onto the show. We're going to find out a little bit about his life and how he got into writing. And then we're also going to look at uh, the Lockwood series in the middle. Uh, and then over to you for part three. Yeah, definitely. Um, just before we do that, I, I want to show you some of the Harrogate Festival was amazing. And what we do with the videos for Harrogate and things like that is to give you an experience of what a festival of writing is like on the ground. So if you ever want to go, you can see. Um, and this is something I stole, Chris, and you haven't seen this yet. Jonathan Mars, he's one of the guests that is going to come up on season 12 of our show. Jonathan Mars is an incredible author who said on the show he does not do live shows. So the fact that he trusted us to come on the show and do this is amazing. I interviewed him at Harrogate. He gave, um, I stole this from the Pan McMillan team and he wrote on there, thanks Chris for making this so easy. And he drew a big mustache on there and I carried that home and it saved me from the rain um, on the Saturday night. Um, so, so just- your makeshift umbrella. It is, it was my make makeshift umbrella. 
Um, Jonathan Stroud is coming up season. Uh, sorry, um, John Mars is coming John, up John season. Mars. Yeah, season twelve. So yeah, yeah, definitely stay tuned. And we've got some brilliant, brilliant stories coming up. Maybe you could so, get the Lockwood Festival going if you, you know, you've mm-hmm. been to Harrogate and that was so, so successful. Maybe there's room for a Lockwood Festival somewhere. <laughs> I'm sure with this this many people loving his show and his book series and his his catalogue of series that Jonathan Straub could have his own festival. I'm sure it could happen. Um, and I'm sure <laughs> there are people probably discussing that already. So should we get into the show, Chris? Because I know people are eager to see our guest tonight. Yeah, definitely. People don't want to hear from us. Let's get Jonathan on. (laughs) (laughs) Well, let's hope they do a little bit. Um, So I'm going to introduce tonight's guest, uh, who is a best-selling author of the... I I, I want to say this, but I'm probably going to say it wrong. So please, in the comments, let me know. Bartimus Trilogy. I can't say the word. And the Lockwood & Co. series, obviously, uh, which has been a fantastic series in the book book format and on Netflix. He's worked as an editor for several years uh, become, before becoming a full-time writer, and his books have been translated to 30, over 30 languages, which always blows my mind, and has won numerous awards. He's also very passionate uh, about literacy, and he visits schools and libraries to talk uh, to young readers about his work, which I think is very valuable. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the fabulous Jonathan Stroud. Hello, Jonathan. Hello, how are you doing? Uh, we're fantastic. Um, thank you. Nice to see you. Yeah, Chris and Chris. Um, yes, cheers to you. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. How are you doing tonight, Chris, uh, Jonathan? Uh, I'm, I'm doing very well indeed. It's a much more exciting Friday night than I normally have. Normally, I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm sort of collapsed in a corner with, with a, a cushion over my head. But today, it's a, a great pleasure to be with you guys and with everyone else out there. I'm really, really very excited to be chatting with you. Oh, fantastic. And uh, where in the world are you coming from tonight, just so people know? Uh, well, I live in uh, Hertfordshire, which is kind of about, which is north of London. I'm about 20 miles north of of, of London, uh, where lots of my books are set. So, yeah, I'm ho- home yeah. territory for me. You definitely um, emphasise a, a London a lot in your stories, and we'll get into that at some stage, because I always love people visiting areas and using that to translate into their books. I think it's brilliant. But um, before we do that, the first part of the show, I'll play a little video Um, And we want to learn about your road into the writing world, because that's what fascinates us initially. Okay. because it's a very relatable story to people who are looking to get into the writing world. And there's often a lot of tips in there people don't realize. So I'll play this little video and hopefully we can get a good insight into your writing, uh, the steps into your writing world. Okay. so part one of the show is called The Road to Writing. And here's the video. So, Jonathan, if you could let us all know about what the first uh, transition into writing for you was, and was there any inspirational characters or books that really drove that kind of inspiration? Um, well, yeah. So, for, I don't know about you guys, but for me, um, writing was always something that I think, even when I was very small, was 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 there as a as an itch that I wanted to that I wanted to do, and. Um, a lot of my my friends at school were kind of hanging out in the playground, wanting to be um, you know great football players and things. And I I, I don't know I I always had inside my head a kind of a dream to uh, to 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 write. I don't I don't think I actually had a had a vision of what I was going to write, but I I always <laughs> liked making up um, stories. Um, and um, I can prove it because I have um, uh, here some of my very earliest works. Uh, this little one. Um, I don't know how well you can see it. Diamond theft. I think I did when I was probably about eight or something, and um, it's falling apart now. But it was uh, I made it on a, a, a wet weekend uh, with, and I stuck all these bits of paper together with with, with glue. And you can see that the uh, the glue's gone <laughs> brown. That's how that's how old this book is, and how old wow. I am. Um, it's a, and not to answer your question, it was a kind of I, I was inspired by these little books. Um, Called tracker books, which which had different routes through. You could choose whether to go left or right, or you know chase the bad guy, or or run away, or whatever. And so you had different different endings, um, and they were quite primitive, but I absolutely loved them. And so this was this was my attempt to do a little tracker book, and it, it uh, I, I made it with all these bits of paper and then put them together at the end with multiple endings. So. Um, Wow. There you, there you go. That's how that's how it started with a little tatty book like this. But I put a I put a, a nice cover on it as well because I, I I wanted it to become a real book rather than just some you know a piece of paper in my um uh, on my bedroom floor. 
Jonathan, I want to interrupt there because we've had people on so many times where we've talked about their writing as a young person. I'm talk I, I often ask, is that something you worked on again, ever took that story into the future? Um, but we've never shown evidence, been shown evidence of it. And that is an absolutely <laughs> awesome thing to see. Um, how, well, how have you, did you consciously keep that knowing that one day it would be something great to look back on? Uh, no, but I, I, but I was a hoarder, you know, I, 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 I think even, even then I did have a kind of impulse, which I think, you know, I'm sure you guys are the same as a writer, you know, you, you never throw anything away because you, you sit there, like you said, Chris, at the beginning, it's kind of a lonely business. You sit there and you, you scribble away, you type away, whatever, and you, you know, some days are good, some days are not good. Um, and some days you look at it and you think, well, what have I, what have I achieved? But you, as, as you know, that there will always be pieces of fragments or sentences or ideas which you know you can then just keep and later you can use it and, and bring it bring it into play in, in something down the line so even as a kid I think I sensed that it was better not to you know not to bin anything um and it's it's great now because I can I can I can bore people rigid by bringing out <laughs> pieces of uh, uh, of, of, uh, of of work from you know different times well it, I love that Jonathan I was going to say, can you can you read us the first line by any chance? Of, oh. of, <laughs> yes, come on, <laughs> just, just out of interest. Yes, okay. yeah, yeah. So um, uh, I'll, I'll read you the first page. Oh, that's that's how generous I am. Here we go. Um, this is this is diamond theft. Uh, half past three last night, Lady Moneybag's diamond necklace was stolen by a man named Steve Jones. Oh, Steve Jones. He was seen in a red Ford, registration number DGS six zero three T which is my parents' number, with a <laughs> necklace round his head. The inspector told me about it. It's my job to keep track of him and, if possible, possible capture him and recover the necklace. And there's a little picture of the of the uh, the diamond necklace there. So a detective story that hits you with the with the action right, right from the start. That is yeah, amazing. I love that. I mean, so many questions straight from the off. Um, you know, so it's clear that you're a very talented writer, even at eight years old. Why? Well, I... I uh, I don't know about that, but I was, um, <laughs> I, you know, I, I think it comes down to sort of having having that itch inside you. Um, mm. you, you know, there'll be a day where, it, like, like I can remember doing it. I can remember it was a mm. kind of, one of, it was one of those terrible autumn weekends where the weather's really bad and, mm. you know, you're not going out and you're at home and, you and you know, back in the, I guess, the late 1970s or whenever it was, there wasn't much to do. So, you know, at that point, I would just sort of go and I'd just drift there and I would sit and I would, um, you know, I had this little urge just to try and try and make something. It was about, it was about trying to finish a little book. Um, and I, I do remember the satisfaction of actually holding it up and thinking, oh, ah, OK, I've made this. It, it, it's a proper it's a proper thing. And I, and, um, I guess that 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 impulse uh, has never has never left me. I mean, you guys presumably have a similar. You guys have a similar thing. You, did you did you do a lot of writing when you were when you were small? Uh, for me, not at all. Um, I was always a lover of film and story in that sense. And right. I, I've written two self-published novellas, but I've, I've since then transitioned into screenwriting. So that's my love coming through in that sense yes. of creativity. Yes. Um, but Chris, what about yourself? Yeah, I mean, I did a lot of reading uh, when I was younger. I never thought I could actually, I never thought I'd be good enough to take on writing uh, and to tackle uh, fiction until I was an adult. Um, didn't start writing my first sort of stories till I went to college and sort of 18, 19. And then I, can't, I always had a love for reading, like I read uh, the Goosebumps books and big on Stephen King and things like that. Uh, but I never thought, Do you know what, I turned my hand at this. And then one day I read a book, and I'm not going to name the book, but I thought if this got published, <laughs> then I might have a chance. <laughs> I might be able to give it a go. So, um, yeah, then I started from there. So, yeah. Amazing. It, interestingly, um, people in the chat, let us know if if you're someone that follows Jonathan and you're a writer, let us know uh, kind of what age you started writing that because that's really interesting. But, Jonathan, at the stage of an eight-year-old writing such a creative book and also not just a story, a book that has alternate endings and things like that, which is very detailed and interestingly thought of what did you do next at that stage you've written something you're obviously proud of at that age what was the next step for you into that writing world um 
Well, I mean, I, I suppose for for quite a few years, you, you, you know, you're 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 sort of stuck because you're you've got the whole school, you've got school, you've got you've got life, you've got teenage life, all all um, uh, kind of weighing down on you. And um, the, the the art really is to sort of keep reading and to keep and to keep writing if you can. So so for many years, I I guess I I carried on I carried on in my spare time, always making little little books. And I and and I got well, I got I got better because I got here another one. Um, this was this was um this was one from when I was about twelve or something. Um, and you can see wow. my artwork because my artwork. No way. Like, uh, Tower of the Undead. Um, and by this point, I was into fighting fantasy books, which Puffin Puffin did. I don't know whether you guys ever read those, but they were they were they were terrific. And again, they were they were much more sophisticated, but they had lots of different routes through, and you were playing games and rolling dice. And I I you know kept on I kept on sort of experimenting with wow playing around with uh you, you know with, with 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 stories. And it has to be said that you know that my subject matter hasn't changed in in uh, 40 years because these books are filled with demons and ghosts and all, and all the rest of it and um uh, that's, that's kind of what i still do but i guess i guess the point was i was still having fun i was still keeping the fire burning even though most of my time i was obviously you know working doing schoolwork and you know running around and um doing other, doing other stuff you know as, as you would so I, I i didn't have a clue that i was going to do anything with this but um <laughs> again it was it was just there you know, ticking over in the background that is another incredible e exhibition of your earlier work because <laughs> I'm sure if that was up updated and sold, it would sell hundreds. Well, I, don't, I don't know. It looks good from a distance, but um... <laughs> it looks incredible. <laughs> that what was it called again? The Tower of that, that was the tower. That was Tower of the Undead. Yeah, I did. I did a lot. Of, yeah. It sounds um, like my perfect read. I'm not going to lie, Jonathan. Well, it, you know, it's got lots of you know <laughs> subtle, subtle emotions and um, you know <laughs> romance and no, it was it was it was a it was a particular kind of thing, and it really kept me very happy when I was um, uh, you know 12, 13. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, and I, and I did comics and and board games, and you know, I I I guess there was always this, that that same urge just to to make things and um i had a friend who uh we we used to do a we had a kind of game book club at school mm. so he and i would mm. we it was kind of competitive and this was this was quite a cool thing actually having someone having someone who shared your enthusiasm and you both went off and independently worked on games and and books and things and then you'd come back and show it and then you think oh he did a really excellent game are oh, much better than mine and you go off and you, you try and you know try and uh, do something better yourself so that it was good to have someone to bounce off i think that's yeah. a that's probably a quite a quite a sort of important tip certainly at certain points in you know in in, in your career so at 11 stroke 12 years old you're writing your next stages of your book so you're clearly finding your feet in the fantasy world yeah where did that go on from there because uh, i'm interested in kind of Obviously, from a young age, you you had that creative mind. You were brilliant at creating, uh, ju not just writing, but illustration as well. At what point did that become something more serious in terms of a career for you? So um, I think by the time I left left school, I went to, I went I went to university, and by the time you kind of end up doing your A levels, you know you haven't got much time to uh, to to do um, any of this, or at least I, I didn't. So I can I can kind of remember that I, I I was ticking over, but I wasn't doing very much. When I went to university, I did I studied English. So in a way, for a while, my creative um, juices got sort of poured into the kind of academic side, and I was kind of studying text and reading text and analysing them and saying, well, why do I like this one? Why is that one boring? Um, so in a way, I was just sort of becoming a better reader, which is all obviously part of the the same process about being a writer, writing, writing and reading are two parts of the same thing. So although I wasn't writing so much, well, I was writing, I was writing essays and, you know, stuff, but I wasn't doing, mm. I wasn't, um, I wasn't producing, you know, my own fiction or anything for, for a while. At university, I um, tried my hand at uh, writing poems, which weren't very good. And I tried plays. I, did, I wrote, a, wrote a couple of plays, which I don't think were <laughs> particularly good either, but I was giving it a go. And I think this is a, this is a thing which, you, I'm sure, and everybody who's watching, uh, you, you know, it's about trying to find your voice. What kind of writer are you? Are you a playwright? Are you a, a is it, are you a, uh, I, I was writing a diary. I did a lot of diary writing. So I was constantly, um, you know, uh, keeping, keeping the pen moving. But um, I was, I was searching for the kind of writer I was. I didn't have any, any great confidence that I was ever going to get published. 
um, and I left university and I had no not a clue what what to do. And by chance, I got a job uh, as a um, an assistant at a publishing uh, house in London called Walker Books, who uh, are a spe- they 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 they're, they're children's children's publisher. Um, that was a complete sort of uh, by by chance. Um, yeah. So I was I was I was suddenly immersed in my early twenties. I was immersed in the publishing world from the from the other side, from the kind of editorial side. And I spent a couple of years there watching uh, how books were made um, and sort of uh, be doing editorial work, sort of helping out helping out with that. Um, and that and that was fascinating. You know, looking back, that was a very important stage because. Again, if you're a writer, I'm sure you you're, you guys are the same. You, you 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 know you write, but then you also have to put your editorial hat on and mm. be, pre- be prepared to 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 scrap things and move things and um, be quite cold hearted. So um, that those are my cold hearted years of sort of learning learning that particular yeah. part of the of the of the trade. You, uh, you're learning the craft at that point. Yeah. Progress. Jonathan, how did you navigate then the the reading from a critical point of view at university to then moving yeah. into a career where you see in how the publishing industry works to then finding your voice as a creative? Because I can imagine the three would be quite difficult for a writer to navigate because you've got the, for, you, for me, going to university and reading and studying literature ruined reading for me for at least a year until I could get kind of get back into it because I was just in that critical mindset. Yes. Yeah. And I can imagine having that coupled with working in the industry being quite a difficult thing for you to try and navigate your creative path because you'd probably compare yourself to people that you'd read or that you'd studied and or that you were helping promote and things like that. So how did you navigate that path? That's a really good point, Chris. Yeah, um I you you're right. It was a bit odd. It you know, it took me it took me some years to to navigate those those different points like you're right it's kind of like a triangulation that you had the academic side you had the kind of commercial uh editorial side and then you had the the third bit which was like well what kind of writer am I and for a long time I couldn't kind of uh fit, fit it together um mm. you're right that academia is a funny one I mean I think it was really really useful to do it but by the end of the three years I was desperate to get out of academia and to get into a world where uh I was I think approaching books from a from a different from a more creative uh, um, mm. point and the editorial side really really helped me it helped me particularly because Walker books was a very creative company independent um, it had they had a lot of money at the time because they had they published where's Wally which was the best-selling children's book series in the world at the time and so they they had quite a lot of, quite a, they were quite happy to sit around discussing ideas for, for books and, and for game books, which was which interested me because of all the stuff I'd been doing for, you know, as a kid. Mm. Um, and so for after a while, I gravitated into the, helping them out with thinking of ideas for uh, for game books. And they, they were quite good because they said, okay, you can carry on being an editor, but in your spare time, if you want to do some writing for us, why don't you, why don't you try and write something? So my first book that I ever actually did with my name on it was, was this little book, a book of, Book of Word Puzzles, uh, which mm. took me about a month to write. And it's just lots of little, you know, word searches and um, uh, acrostics and different, uh, you know, you, any kind of word puzzle that you could, you could name. Um, and I, you can kind of imagine I quite like doing this because it, it, it's a distant relation of all the things that I was doing um, mm. uh, as a kid. And I, so I was able to dip my toe in the water um, and actually have my name on a, on a book. Uh, which which was really thrilling, and I was I think I was probably twenty four or something when that one came out. So I was I was still you know relatively young, but I I had my first foot on the ladder, I suppose. Hmm. It's an amazing thing to to have dabbled in so many different parts of that industry and get the insight as well for to become an author, but go through that process. So was there anything that you took? Was there any advice that you took from that stage of your life where you're working as an editor that you could pass on to? I have noticed some people in the in the chat are talking about their writing or trying to get their writing life going. Any advice as an editor you could pass on to someone? I mean, from the point of view of of, of um, on a sort of day to day level, you know, you you have to follow uh, you have to follow what what interests you. So um, if you, there's no point in trying to write something that fundamentally 
bores you or is it isn't your thing you have to follow your nose so if you if you like romance that you then then write a romance if you like fantasy do do something uh fantastical um you then have to be sort of quite prepared to submit it to people and get rejected and um and kind of not get too disheartened because that's kind of part of the part of the process i mean i experienced this myself because when i was working as an editor i in my spare time, I went home and I tried writing my first novel. And I, I did a version and I, I gave it to one of the editors um, and she absolutely took it apart. She sort of took me in and said it was far too long and overwritten and, um, you know, wrong age group. And 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 I, I was really disheartened. And I went and um, I can remember I sort of put it in a drawer and I, I, I left it for about a year, um, just feeling kind of quite de depressed by it. Um, but then eventually I... Got, got it out again and dusted it off and I sent it out to other editors in other publishing houses um, and eventually someone picked it up and said oh yeah yeah it's completely overwritten and it's um, far too long and but they, if you if you if you change it if you if you work on it you edit it you um, trim it we will publish it so yeah the the story there was not to get depressed and put it in a drawer for a year the, what i should have done is 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 just sort of immediately send it out to um to to other people because mm. the, the, a lot of it's to do with opinion i mean it, the book needed lots of work there was no doubt about it but the person who saw the potential of it was able to uh, bring me in and actually uh, make me a published novelist it's amazing, isn't it? And I think the amount of people we've had on this show that have gone through that same similar process have always said that the key is actually taking rejection as part of the process and using that as then yeah. the, the baseboard for development and improvement rather than feeling like you spoke about there where you, you kind of felt like your work was not good enough. It's just part of the process where the improvement comes in. And it's all about self-development at that stage. And I think that's important to know uh, that that it is crucial that you will have that kind of negativity at some stage, but to use it in the right way. Yeah. And I, and that's absolutely right. And I think it's, it's, it's kind of mirrored even on a, on a kind of micro level when you're sitting at your desk on your own and you're, you know, you're writing your, whatever it is you're doing and you're, you're, you're typing out your, your sentences and you kind of look at it and you go, yeah, that's not really, that's not really good enough. Um, you know, you, 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 you scrub it out or you, or you put it, I often just sort of put it to the bottom of the page and then and then write something different. And actually, you're absolutely right. You know, the the, the process of looking at something and saying it's not quite good enough, but I will have another go. Mm. That's kind of the essence of writing, isn't it? You know, you keep you keep working at it until eventually that sentence is is exactly what you what you want. The, mm. you, you have to self reject. Um, and that, that's 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 what you do on a daily basis. Mm. There's a, a comment come in from. Uh... That's a big name. Uh, Lavender Ghost Co. It says, imagine oh, yes. if Jonathan never took it back out of the drawer, none of us would be here right now. And that's that's <laughs> an act actually brilliant point because that is the case for probably so many writers that you must keep on, if you believe in the story and believe in your ability, or even if you don't believe in your ability at that stage, you must keep on if you're passionate about it. So, yeah, keep on at it. and um, Perseverance. Um... Yeah. And and experimentation, you know, you, you don't you don't know what kind of writer you are when you set out. You it, it's a journey. You have to you have to just put one foot in front of the other, and you sort of you, you plod along on the journey. And you, sometimes you're kind of going downhill, and you, it, it's going fast, and you realise that you're you're getting flu it's fluent, it's coming out, the pages are going. Other times you're plodding uphill, and it's really slow, and you know you're tearing your hair because it's not. But actually, it's all part of the same um, the, the same process, and ultimately. Mm -hmm. you, you, you get to your goal. Mm. I've got like a, a bit of a three headed question. Um, and the re the reason why I'm talking about the mental health and the roller coaster of authors, um, yeah. that you kind of been talking about. Um, but I'll, I'll ask the first two very quickly. One with the word puzzles. Did you send it to your companion, uh, who you wrote with when you were eight years old, just to say, look, my name's on a book for the first time. Um, and if so, how did they react? And then my, Second, third question for that is what change would you like to see in the publishing industry to help authors with their mental health? That's a great question. Um, so yes, in terms of the, um, of, of the book, yeah, I, I, I think I did. I mean, I, I'm still very much in touch with my, with my, my, my 
friend who who I um, did those things with. Um, mm. And yes, I, I, I've, I'm poor, poor chap. He's had all kinds of books given to him over the years, you know. Um, <laughs> uh, but um, yeah. uh, is he but, has he come back with any of his own or? Uh, no, he's, he's got a PhD, so he's you know I think I've probably got his doctorate on my shelf somewhere. So you know he, <laughs> he's, he's giving me something pretty good back. Um, yeah, yeah, um, it's yeah that was that's, that's a pleasure. There's a real kind of continuity actually, um, and in fact you know his kids now come to you know come to my events. So there's a there's a there's a lovely sense of circularity um, in in that. I think you know having friends having fr that, that's why the the Lockwood. Uh, the Lock Nation community, um, uh, you know, support support my the series and the books is so great because it, it, the, the community is really important. As you said at the beginning, you're writing or you're creative, it's a very solitary business. And actually, having a support network, having having lovely people who you can rely on to discuss uh, things um, uh, and, and and give give proper feedback is really important. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, I think in terms of the publishing industry at the moment. Um, when I set out, there was always this sense I felt that um, I, I mean, there were always there were always sort of commercial um, uh, parameters that the publishers had to deal with. Um, but mm. it, I, I certainly feel like when I started out, um, publishers were pretty open to um, new new voices, new new writers, people turning up with with unsolicited manuscripts um, um and you know i was one of them who uh, i found someone who was prepared to take a punt on me even though mm. my 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 books didn't make any money for the publisher for you know for many for many years that wasn't the point they were interested in me as a as a voice um mm. I, that's still very much the case that the publishers are still looking there are, there are great editors out there um but you do sometimes feel like it's harder to 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 be heard i think as a as a young as a young writer, I, mean, I think agents agents are very important as well. They do they do a, a very good job of of again trying to track down these people who are just coming up, the new the new writers. Um, mm. But it is hard. I, I think it for young writers at the moment, it's, it's it is very difficult to be uh, to get that first book, that first foot in foot in the door. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, I, the, the more that we as a community support the the younger writers, the better it is. Um, yeah, I mean, I suppose, sorry, Chris, I was going to say, I suppose one of the expectations when you first bring a book out as a debut author is, wow, my book's been picked up, this many people believe in it, it's going to be a bestseller, it's going to be do amazing, my life's going to change. And then in some, in probably 99% of cases, that is not the case. And, you know, if you're lucky, maybe that happens in the long term. Um, but I suppose preparing people for that mentally because uh, i mean can you remember the process of being signed with an agent and then your first book being sent out to the world like how was that managed how did they manage your expectations were they like jonathan you're the best thing ever this is going to be amazing or were they like look we might sell a couple of hundred books um and if we do that would be great and then we you know we build from there type thing yeah i i think i think managing expectations is really important i mean you know you everyone everyone always hears these sort of wonderful stories about people who who their first book gets to, gets snapped up for amazing amazing figures and there are auctions yeah. and things <clears throat> but they're they're very much the kind of exception they're the it's like it's like the iceberg where where 90 percent of it's up the water actually that that's 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 quite odd that's quite freakish <clears throat> um, I, mean, I remember very very clearly that the with my first book, the, the first books, the, the the real pleasure was the. And I'm sure you feel the same. The real pleasure is when you suddenly get a thing through the post and you open it up and you have a um, a, a real book with a real cover and it's got your name on it and it exists in the world. And that <clears throat> that in itself is is a is a triumph. You know, if you have if you have <clears throat> put the hours in and you've 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 created uh, a, a book which is then exist in this form you you by definition you have done you have done really really well so um certainly my my publishers didn't didn't sort of throw massive parties or um you know tell me that i was gonna gonna expect anything big it, the, the, the pleasure was in the fact that the book existed and um you know i'd go looking booking bookshelves and eventually I might, I might see in a shop i might see my book uh what one copy and <clears throat> the, the, the pleasure was the fact that you had achieved a book I mean, I, that money was not the you know, not the expectation, um, really, and I don't. I think that's true of, every, of m m most most authors. Yeah, definitely. You, you've got to do, you've got you, you've got to do it because you love the process of 
of of making something and that and and pass it yeah. on <clears throat> you know when you when you when you're a kid and you pick up some beautiful some great book or when you watch a movie you know and you you sit there and you absorb the story and you just think this is this is great somebody has done this and they've they've, they've made my life better as a result of this and uh -huh. uh, i think that's the driving force that you want to you want to tell a story which you can pass on to somebody else as part of this sort of endless chain of you know uh of storytelling and um if you do it and other people like your story then that's the best feeling uh, every, everything else is 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 a sort of froth you know on the on, on the outside i'm gonna have to stop you there chris in your run of great questioning um by the way because we are pushing over part two and i i definitely want to stick to the timings because i know we're going to get a lot of questions from the chat so we're going to jump onto part two of the show which is called what's the story and I'll let I'll leave this up to you, Jonathan, what we talk about, but I'm sure right. a lot of the audience are gonna to want to talk about a certain series that you've written. <laughs> so <laughs> here's part two of the show, little video, uh, watch the story coming up. So Jonathan, what's the story? We'd normally ask you to talk about your latest book, but I think the topic of tonight is about Lock Nation, the Lockwood series. Right. The fantastic show, the fantastic book series. Um, can we can we learn a bit about that process or just about that story and where that came from and, and maybe who knows what you think about the current situation it's in? Um, well, yeah, I mean, I'm obviously delighted that you guys have um, given me the opportunity to sort of chat chat a bit about about um, all my stuff, but particularly um, about Lockwood and Co. Because there's such a, a wonderful um, community of, uh, of of fans of of Lockwood and Co. out there. Um, and um, yeah, so so in terms of the in terms of the book series first, um, uh, I, I can remember quite clearly I, I was sitting in this very in this very seat in this very room. Um, back in 2011 um, and I had I had recently finished a book and I was trying to think of new ideas for for the series and what mm -hmm. I did for it was it was in the summer I think and I every day I would just sit at the computer and kind of riff and sort of improvise a scene and one t one day I did one about a zombie another day I did one as a sci-fi story and I, I just kind of started these little scenes I had no idea what the stories were um, and uh, and I did several of these, and then one day I sat down, and um, I have the piece. I have the piece of paper here, um, which um, was the was the first bit of writing, um, and um, it, I think it's pretty much the same, almost the same as what was actually eventually published. But the, I, the first line was uh, of the first few hauntings investigated by Lockwood and myself. I intend to say nothing, in part to protect the identity of the victims in part because of the gruesome nature of the incidents themselves, but mainly because in a variety of ingenious ways, we had succeeded in cocking them all up. Um, and that was the first that was the first line that I wrote for uh, what became uh, The Screaming Staircase, uh, Lockwood & Co. And it was almost, in fact, that sentence was almost entirely used in the in the eventual book, apart from the phrase, cocking it all up, which my, <laughs> my publisher, uh, was, was shook their it shook, shook shook their head so sort of quite quite sort of severely and told me off you can't you can't use that term so in the in the actual book it says messing it all up which I thought was yeah. far less far less punchy um, but um, yeah that was the so so I wrote this I wrote this little scene on this first day I wrote this little scene of a boy and a girl um, <clears throat> who were ghost hunters and they were walking um, uh, up to a to knock on the door of a house in order to fight a ghost and they were modern kids and they had but they had rapiers and they had all kinds of equipment mm -hmm. um and uh i had no idea uh why they were going there on their own where, where were the adults uh not, not a clue um the, the world i didn't know anything about that i didn't really know who they were in fact i um looking at this i i, I knew that the boy was called lockwood um that that was there right from the beginning but the girl uh she says, uh, when, when she first gives her name, she says, Mrs. Hope, good evening, madam. My name is Harriet Vaughan, and this yeah. is Anthony Lockwood. So, um, yes, yeah, so Anthony Lockwood's name was there right from the beginning, but Lucy's name was completely different. Um, and I didn't have a clue who they were, what they were doing, but I did like them. And, and this is the key, I think, as a, uh, you know, I'm sure you guys are the same. When you, when you, when you find characters that you 
that you are interested in and you, uh, and you like the way they talk to each other or they have something about them, you want to spend more time with them. And so I was quite happy then to select this as the, as the, the story that I, that I followed um, uh, and, and, and began to develop into a proper, a proper book. Just to interrupt there, I've forgotten to do something, but I'll do it right now. And, and this is a great time to do it. Um, Georgia, who we spoke to just before, Jonathan, um, has agreed that we can potentially do a giveaway for a signed copy of one of ah, the books. Yes. OK. Um, so what I'm going to do, everybody that's watching this right now, which is great for you guys, if you could go on to uh, in the chat and write Portland Row, which is a crucial part of the story, of course, and I'd like to talk about that in a minute. Put Portland Row into the into the chat, and you will be entered into a draw that we will pull out at the end of the show, um, and then we will be able to pull a winner out of that and send away a signed book um, to the winner of that. Um, so please, in the chat, Portland Row, put that in right now, and you will see seven entries. Right, it's starting to come in. Brilliant. And let's get back into the story because I was enjoying that. Um, yeah. So what's really interesting is your you talked about the character development there in yeah. terms of the names and names for me when it comes to writing i i struggle yeah um, but why did you d decide at that point lucy was then becoming lucy later on in the story well it took me a, it took me a little while i can't remember how long but i know that i i wrote i, I spent several weeks writing a bit more of the story kind of trying to figure out what who these guys were and what the world was and you know what was the ghost and how do they fight it um and i tried different names i tried different uh, several different names because i knew that that that, that first name wasn't right um uh, and i i would just kind of bung in a name and, and try it and oh no that doesn't work and um it, it took me quite a long time to 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 go to lucy and eventually i did like lucy um mm. Uh, that, that that sounded right. Um, uh, it had sort of faint, it had faint echoes of Lucy in you know in, in, in the Narnia books. So somebody you know somebody who is able to uh, walk from one world to another. I, li yeah. I like I liked that echo. Um, but also it's a nice it's a nice name. And um, uh, you know by that point I realised that she came from the north of England and she was um, a lot less kind of sure of herself than. Anthony Lockwood, who was kind of, who, who seems very self-possessed, um, uh, and I, I, I instantly liked Lucy, and I wanted to use her voice to to tell the story. There, there are a lot of comments at the start of this show about how much they, the the books and the TV series lined up so well. Oh and yeah, you mentioning Lucy and and the comparison to Narnia. Now you mention it is 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 fantastic. I really see that in the character. Um, when it came to the series being developed as an author, what was your first impression of learning that news? How did you take that as an author? And was that ever something you were striving for before that happened? Um, so, so yes. I mean, I, obviously, I was, I was, bowl, I was bowled over. I was, I was delighted. When, mm. when um, it's a long, it's a long process. So when I, when I, when I was still writing the first book, um, we had interest in in it uh, from from. Uh, film film company and uh, I, I, I the, the rights were optioned by um, I think Universal um, uh, Illumination uh, Illumination who did um, um, Despicable Me and things like that yeah. they, they they were interested in doing it um, and we had they worked on it for a while but um, in the end I think they 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 moved away from live action and they were interested in other things um, so that that sort of went quiet but but from a fairly early point. Um, uh, the guys who 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 became complete fiction, um, Joe Cornish, Naira Park, Rachel Pryor, that they were they were interested in it for, for quite early, um, and they kept tabs on it. And um, right about the time that I finished the series, they 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 um, made made inquiry and um, took the option. And we had to wait for some time while Joe was working on um, his other projects. But uh, you, you know they they were they they were always they were always very very articulate about how. Uh, how much they a like the like the books, like the characters, like the world, the Englishness of it, um, and and I knew that they were great. I knew that these guys had done amazing films and amazing TV. Um, you know, they, they had a, a wonderful. They, they were brilliant mixes of of comedy and, and drama and horror and Englishness, and it was all sort of mixed together. So I knew that they were that they were they were a wonderful um uh you know company who who might well be able to do something um great with lockwood so i, I was very i was very excited from the from the word go yes incredible 
Yeah, Jonathan, I was going to say, um, in terms of writing fiction then and, and writing fiction yeah. that's, that scares people, um, <laughs> I suppose my question is in, in two folds. What scares you? And then how do you – how – can a writer scare people on the page nice oh good question well i am i do get scared by ghosts i mean i don't i don't, I don't really believe in ghosts but i um, as a as a kid it, get, it all goes back to it as a kid so as a kid i can remember sitting there with my osborne um uh, b- uh, mysteries of the unknown and there was a great book about ghosts which i know actually joe cornish had as well and this was the kind of book that if you if you were a kid in the 70s this book was the best it had every ghost possible it was really kind of gruesome and bloody and, and exciting um and it, so ghosts always uh, were part of my were part of my my dna and i wanted to try it as an author i wanted to to experiment with with making things that would have scared, would scare me um and, and and would hopefully scare other people and you know in terms of how i tried to do it i guess I guess it's a sort of suspense thing. And I think it links in very much to my enjoyment of film and TV that, you know, I think visually and I think in terms of building up a slow sequence where you enter the building and you you hear things and you see things and it just ratchets up the tension and you take your time and then little things happen. And, you know, slowly you can you can make it more and more uh more and more frightening. And then you you obviously you can have the have the ghost turning up and you 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 counterbalance it by having humor and the kind of light the, the the light moments where your characters are in portland row having a chat at the kitchen table getting cross with each other because you know george has forgotten to do the washing up or lucy's you know lost uh you know the the, the salt bombs or something and and you you that you then you have that kind of humor the the lightness which then counterbalances the dark and that was quite an important um uh, component um for me, you know, when I when I was writing it. So we, we are flying through these questions and time. Um, but what I want to yeah. ask about is because we mentioned it earlier, I really like, and I know other people do as well, how a writer gets into the scenery of a setting. And London is such a brilliant place for moving yeah. dark scenes like you've written and like we saw in the Netflix series. So why did you decide Portland Row, for example, that street that you created was such a great place for the Lockwood family to kind of base their base their work. Why was that such an important scene for you, or as the environment? It, that's a great question. I I knew that I knew very early on on that I wanted Lockwood uh, and Lucy and George to live in li- to live in a house. Yeah, they lived in their own house. It was their base. It was a place of sanctuary. It was a kind of place where they would be safe. And you had all the sort of horrible things that they would encounter. But then they'd come back to this to this place. And it would be their home, a place where they could eat and relax, and you know, be 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 young. It, and I knew straight away that was that was that was key. Um, and I decided it was going to be in a kind of ma- in Marylebone in the in the in in, in London. Um, and I um, there, there, there are places there are sort of Portland there are Portland streets and things in that area. Um, but I, I looking at them, they were kind of too big. So I I basically made up the idea that there's going to be a Portland Row, which is somewhere off you know in that in that in that area but they're all these big townhouses and they're both kind of um they're very homely but they're also very very london um uh they have mystery you have a, you have a cellar I, yeah. I i i absolutely um loved uh embedding them in this mm-hmm. in albeit imaginary street in the middle of a real london so I, I would use real generally i'll use real locations in order to make the fantasy seem uh, more real, which is I tend to do in all my books. I, you know, I try to make it balance the fantasy with something that's essentially mm. realistic. I mean, the Was property. That... Sorry, Chris. Uh, no, uh, pro- sorry. Go on, you, mate. <laughs> <laughs> we're too eager to ask the questions. We've got so much to talk yeah, yeah. about. We're flying. <laughs> I was just going to say, sorry, while we're on the topic, that Portland Road. When you talk about the the building that they're in, it's so perfect. And I, again, I haven't actually had time to read the books, but I've seen the series. It works so well on the levels that you spoke about because you've got the the kind of kitchen area that they they do their general talking their operations that's their their place of kind of acknowledgements of what's going on then you've yeah. got the cellar where mystery happens but you've also got that lovely mystery room upstairs which is what the cliffhanger we were left on oh. in the season yes. so it's it's really kind of well laid out from not just the outsides and the moodiness of the kind of environment of london and the light scenes and the mist all that great stuff, but the building itself was very intricate in that sense. Was that a conscious decision to make it that multi-tiered kind of um, yes. level of intrigue, if that makes sense? 
you no, know, very very much so. It actually does. And 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 it, and and one one of the one of the brilliant things about about complete fiction and the TV show is that you can you can see their attention to detail in the, in the the what they produced the they they built they built Portland Row in Ealing Studios and they built it in 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 sort of several chunks. Each floor was in a different place, but fundamentally, okay. it fundamentally they built the whole building. And um, when you go inside it, it, it was like being inside a London townhouse. It was absolutely perfect. Um, Marcus Rowland, who's the production designer, and the, the team that who did it, absolute absolute geniuses. And and I and what was amazing, I went in and it felt it felt correct to me. It, it was very 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 close to what I saw in my. Um, in my head, and I think that's true. Hopefully, of the people who who've read the books and you know coming to it mm. from from that from that angle, it was it was really beautifully beautifully done with with infinite uh, attention to detail. You know, you go into Lockwood's living room, and there would be um, some bills on the on the mantelpiece that he hadn't paid. And if you <laughs> the, the camera is never going to pick it up, but if you if you open the envelope and look inside. They, it's a, it's a genuine bill wow. to Mr. Lockwood. You owe us this, but and it's there, and it's just tucked away. So you, the actors, and indeed the you know the viewers, can sense they can sense that it's that it's it's yeah. got that level of of reality in it, which is abs absolutely unbelievable. So, Chris, I know you want to ask this question, but I'm I'm just hogging this. I'm sorry, um, but <laughs> all all right. we, <laughs> when we look at the the whole story. What I really like about the element of the ghost fighters and the young people taking this business forward is the fact that they were trying to take a business forward and they were tr trying to compete with the business around London. Why did you think that was an important part of the show? Uh, uh, sorry, the, the story to have them trying to keep a business surviving whilst trying to fight the ghosts. Why do you think the business element was was kind of a crucial element there? That's, that's a great question. Um, the quite early on when i was writing the you know the first book I, I was trying to figure out okay so uh you've got these kids fighting ghosts well why why are they doing it oh well it's because ch young people have, have got the psychic ability to do it and there's an epidemic of ghosts okay so the kids are going to be the ones who go in and then then you sort of think well okay how it, how would the world develop if that was mm. the case and then you you think well probably what would happen is you'd have lots of adults who 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 uh are, are getting you know they don't they don't want the ghosts to be there but they they need someone to deal with it well they'll they'll employ the kids the kids are the ones who have to go out and risk their lives and the you know the adults are sitting back smoking cigars and you know getting rich on the proceeds and the kids are dying fighting the ghosts so instantly that became kind of an interesting uh theme to explore um and I didn't have to deal with it straight away, but I had it as a as a theme running through the books. Um, and I thought, well, great. So the, the the whole point about Lockwood is that he has his own, for, for whatever reason, he's got his own company. He's got this freedom. He's also got the pressure that he's constantly under pressure because he hasn't paid his bills and he hasn't got enough clients. And but he he's he's doing it for himself. Um, these kids are really young, but as you said, they're also trying to be businessmen. They're trying to. They're trying to to make a make a living, and so instantly you've got several different topics that you can kind of play with and explore while you're also um, going into haunted houses and dealing with 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 spooky things. Um, and I think it's the same with you. But I, when you start a series, you don't know exactly where it's going to go or how it's going to how it's going to work out. You you just put enough into the pot to allow you to. To, to play with it as you as you go and and by the end you're kind of surprised by what you've you know what what you've created I was, I've, I've got to show you my um my structure um i thought this is a this is one of my structures for uh, wow. uh the, Whis the whispering skull the the second lockwood book um because i don't know what you guys do but um i'm constantly you know debating on how to how to make structures of books and how to know what i'm doing um and you can see on this in this book, I, I tried to make a kind of roadmap, a cut oh, going the wrong way, a kind of roadmap mm -hmm. of um, the chapters and what's going to be in each chapter. And um, no doubt, when I wrote it, it, I actually changed it. You know, I'm sure a lot of this is not <laughs> actually correct, but it gave me a, um, a sort of blueprint to follow. Um, mm -hmm. I'm all, I'm always fascinated by by because every book's different. Every book has its own challenges about you know figuring out what, how the heck you're going to make it. Mm -hmm. um, but you need something like this to uh, to ha you know, hang on to for dear life.
Chris, sorry I interrupted you. Do you want to ask your questions before I uh, put part three on? Because we are running behind. I know this is uh, a brilliant chat, and Jonathan <laughs> is a great to questions. That's the problem. Yes, I know, I know. But yeah, <laughs> stick those in, Chris, and then we'll move on. Yeah, I'll ask this question before we move on to the sort of stereotypical writing community chat show questions. But my question was about research in terms of the whole Lockwood series. How much research did you do in in terms of historical London and ghost ghost like encounters in terms of maybe you know true events that you'd read so that's the first part of my question and then the second part is what was the most interesting aspect that you found during your research that you didn't include in the Lockwood series nice oh crikey that's that's good um so yeah so I I think with all with all my books I tend to I tend to sort of build the book on something that I'm already interested in. So I don't sort of start from scratch and, and go, uh, oh, I know nothing about ghosts, but I'm going to start I'm going to start doing a book about ghosts. Obviously, I'd read books of ghosts when I was a kid. And so I had this sort of uh, interest in it and I had various books on the supernatural. And I had I absolutely had books that would sort of like gazetteer that tell you which parts of London creepy ghosts had hung out. and things. So I, I, I was able to build on all of that. Um, and I suppose the key research was the fact that I'd lived in London for a while and I'd, you know, I'd go and visit it and I'd walk around and I knew places. Um, so the first, the very first ghost that Lockwood and Lucy go to is in Sheen Road, which is down near Richmond, which is actually where my, uh, some of my ancestors were, were um, used to live. So, you know, there was, a, there was a kind of personal connection. I could use that. I knew that area um, and I could, I could kind of visualise it in, in, my, in my head. Um, in terms of what I didn't put in, um that's a great question i don't know i mean i i think i think i i i've got a book i've got an encyclopedia of london and it's just got infinite um sort of historical facts about about every about every area and i would i would i go off down side roads for days sort of reading up about tyburn and where, where the you know where the gallows was where, where the executions were and i think oh great i can use that and i never i i ended up not having time for it L london oh, has an amazing sure. history in that sense isn't it really does um, okay we have to push on because part through the show we give you guys a chance to ask questions and i've saved a load already but we we have a couple of staple questions first then we'll get into your questions guys so okay. um part three of the show uh is community questions i couldn't find it then um so i'll play this little video start sending your questions in for jonathan or for, for any of us if you want to ask random questions um and if we find them and have time for them we'll pull them up, up on screen so jonathan after this we'll get some a bit more okay. random questions thrown in there. So let's go right. for it. All right, Chris, I've been chatting way too much. So take this away and go for it. <laughs> no, I'll try and be quick because I know there's loads of questions coming in, but it might help with the admin if I chat for a little minute uh, or two and ask some of the staple questions while you save some of the community Indeed, that questions. that makes sense. Yeah, go for it. Um, but some of the staple questions we have is mm -hmm. if you could take any character from fiction and make that character your own and do whatever you want with that character, um, which character would you choose and why? Oh, um, that's a great question. Um, I think it has to go back to a character that I loved when I was uh, in my teens. Um, mm -hmm. And so, you know, a character that I found charismatic and I kind of wanted, I kind of wanted to be, and I really like, and um, I would pick, um, I would pick uh, Philip Marlowe, the, the, the private eye created by mm -hmm. Raymond Chandler in his, in his private eye novels. Um, and I, I loved uh, I loved him because he was he was kind of very lonely and he was kind of moody and he sort of drink his whiskey and he was very witty and he was constantly getting sort of beaten up by guys in dark alleys. But he was also very honourable and he had this this sense of of right and wrong. He was a heroic a kind of a heroic knight figure in in a in a in a dark world. So yeah, you know I found I found him incredibly charismatic when I was younger and I would love to do something with with him. I love that. Um, the second sort of part to that question is if you could change the ending to anything, whether it be a TV series, a book um, or a film, what would you change the ending of and what would you do with it? Um, I've got I've got two answers. And um, one of them, <laughs> one of them is a kind of like one of them is my sort of uh, 
um, my sort of literary answer, which was I read I read uh, War and Peace by Tolstoy um, years and years and years and years and years ago, and um, I remember getting to the last chapter, and the last chapter was like a massive, great, boring fifty pages, all about um, about basically about his theories about warfare and, and politics and all kinds of stuff. And I oh, I just found I, I found it terribly tedious after all the excitement. <laughs> So I, I would I would I would quietly bin that last that last um, pa- uh, last chapter. Um, my other answer, which I suppose is more more from the heart, is um, um, I, I was a big fan of Buffy the Vampire Slayer back in back in the day, um, and it was very it was very, very influential on me in a way because it it was a it was about it, it mingled comedy and it, fantasy and characters and it was it was terrific. Um, I really really loved it um, and. I, I I remember that I loved the series up to the first five series were great, and then um, maybe the last couple of series it was a bit of a falling off. The, the last series, series seven, I never I never liked it. I felt like they brought in too many new characters and they killed characters off. And um, I, I, it, yeah, I was a bit wary of 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 doing that with my own stuff. So I always with my own books always try and keep it sort of quite tight um, uh, mm. at the end. But that was that was a hugely influential series for me. Mm. Brilliant. And we've got two final questions that we'll, we'll ask. Um, and one of them has kind of become a new one, but we're going to bring it into season 12 because we started asking okay. it midway through season 11. Uh, and that's we're very much aware that we're on the Internet and this video and this interview could last for, for a lifetime. You know, it could outlive us quite easily. Um, so somebody is taking over your estate and the Lockwood series so at some point in the future. Maybe it's 100 years, 200 years from now. What would your message be to them? What would you like them to do with the characters? Oh my gosh, that's a that's a great question. Um, well, you know, I I, I think um, you know when you're lucky enough to have characters who who you follow through a few a few books, um, you get very close to them. And I, you know, I, for me, Lockwood and Lucy and George and the other characters, they they really sort of live they live for me and. Um, uh, I would hope that whoever took the characters on would 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 sort of respect them as as uh, as kind of as living as living characters, which is exactly what Complete Fiction did with 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 their TV show. They you, you, there's an element of trust. You know, you hand over your 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 characters, your babies, to somebody else, and you let them do something with it. And Joe Cornish and the guys, you know, absolutely sort of looked after, nourished, and and um, uh, made my made my characters sort of flourish in new ways. You know that they they're absolutely beautiful things with it. So I would hope that um, someone would do something uh, as wonderful as that. Mm. Incredible. And then the final question that we have uh, as part of our sort of staple questions is a bit morbid, but apologise for this. Um, <laughs> well, so you're on your yeah you're on your deathbed and you're looking okay. back at your writing career. Um, what would you be happy with? What does success look like to you? Um, well, I mean, I, I think, um, well, I mean, I, I think Lockwood, Lockwood and Co. kind of sum, sums it up. You know, at the, the bottom line is, like I said, I feel success is when you when you make a book that you're proud of and that you are able to to send it out into the world. And if you can then get a, a community of people who enjoy the book and who love the characters um, and who then reflect that um you know that creativity back at you then that's the most that's the most uh sensational thing and the fact that i've got uh the, the this wonderful community of lock nation who who produce such wonderful art and stories and uh conversations and e- endless endless creativity that is that is that is being floating around and that um re- really sort of has made my give given a whole new dimension to you know to to this little thing that started off as this piece of paper um, uh, all these years ago, uh, I, I, I believe that I, you know, I, I've, I've had that success, and I'm, I'm very lucky. Wow, it's incredible, and I, I'm, I'm still blown away by the support you've got with Lock Nation. And speaking of this wonderful Lock Nation you have, this wonderful yeah. army of supporters, let's let's finally get some questions in there because I know th- there's been demand already for episode two with Jonathan Stroud and the WCCS, um, because there's lots of other things they want to talk about already. But what we want to do now is get some of the questions in that have been asked. And I, I, I've highlighted a lot of things. 
Um, so we'll try and get through some of them. And Jonathan, at any stage you think, right, I need to leave now, just do some signaling and we'll get you <laughs> no, off. No, no, not at all. Uh, <laughs> got my cup of tea, ready? Oh, oh. Fantastic. So the first one, uh, Nugget Kid. Thank you, good name. Uh, any advice for boosting your book in popularity? And I know one biggest thing that slaps us in the face is self-published authors. Yeah. Because we think we've we've achieved the massive, um, we, we've gained, we've passed that massive hurdle of publishing our book and suddenly marketing slaps us in the face. It's a real issue that we don't quite see coming in the first book. So boosting book popularity is a great question. What's your advice for that? Um, that's, a, that's a great question. I mean, I, I think um, in a way what, what we're doing now is, is, the, is, is the sort of at the heart of it. It's about, it's about um, taking the book into, uh, into the marketplace or into, into the kind of the, the social arena and, and just talking about it. And the way to do that is to, is to find people out there who are like-minded, who like that kind of book. And um, so if you've written a fantasy book, then you find fantasy forums and you 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 throw it out there and you discuss it and you 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 um you enter into conversations. If you like this, maybe you like that. And um it, it's it's about it's about starting a dialogue with with people. And the beautiful thing I think about the the uh the world we're in now is that the that the potential is there. Uh you obviously have to put the time in to to do it, and it's not that's, that's not an that's not an easy thing, but um the audience is there. Um, and it's it's about kind of joining other conversations and then um, inserting inserting your own book and your own your own thing into those. I'm, I'm sure there's a, there's a way of getting other people talking about it. Certainly, Bu building a lock nation is is a great key to that, isn't it? So nugget <laughs> kid, nugget kid, you need you need a, your own nation behind you. I think absolutely. Gosh. Um, okay, Anna. Uh, oh, Anna Ferris. Um, how did you decide that the things the agents would use to fight ghosts? So I'm assuming she means the swords and the techno. Oh, weapons. yeah, that, that's a good question. And that, and that happened on the very first day that I, I, I imagined these guys walking up to the door. And I, I, I knew I knew from all my years of you know reading dodgy books about ghosts that <laughs> um, yeah, evil spirits don't like iron. And they don't like salt and they don't like silver and running water. You know, there are certain things that that traditionally ghosts don't like so i decided i was going to use these elements and i kind of imagined okay they're going to have an iron sword um they're going to have uh some silver silver a silver net to to put over the over the you know the, the bones of the, whatever the ghost is attached to they're going to have a magnesium flare because magnesium is bright and ghosts don't like don't like bright light so i just kind of took the traditional stuff and and turned it into into little bits of kit that you might plausibly have on your belt amazing yeah great question thank you um no lavender uh, ghost co uh who fell down the stairs earlier apparently um can you tweet a picture of the structure this is a request so that what you showed earlier people want to see that in a bit more detail are they able to do that <laughs> oh, oh okay yeah no all right lavender i'll, I'll do that yeah i mean I, you might find that it's completely uh, gobbledygook but i will give it a go <laughs> yes i'll give it, give it a try People enjoy the gobbledygook. It's fine. It's, I'm sure they love that. Um, yeah, bring back Jonathan for another time. Yes, we'll do this. They love the interview so much. Sorry, I'm just highlighting stupid things. Um, not stupid. Thank you. Appreciate that. Um, we need a second show to get into Scarlet Brown. Um, uh, yeah. Will Ali says, "Will the book ever? Uh, sorry, will we ever get a book about the skull?" Well, the skull's the skull's a mysterious character because he he's. Um you know we never even find out his name um and it's, it's an interesting question when you're writing something like this you, you you have to decide whether or not you keep certain things uh secret um and uh or, or just just mysterious um and i at one point i did decide oh yeah maybe I, maybe i'll we'll give the give the, the skull a name we'll find out more about about him um but i actually decided not to in the end because i think almost inevitably it will then uh undercut the yeah, the magic of of who he, of who he is. It's better sometimes to keep things mysterious. So we might do another book with the skull in it, but I'm not sure I would do one about him, uh, ju just him. Yeah, fantastic. But Jonathan, as you as you get to know the background of your characters more and more, yeah, and obviously you're deciding as a writer like what elements to show and what to keep to yourself. Is there? a novel or maybe a couple of novels that you're thinking, do you know what, that has got legs 
for a whole series that I may do. And, uh, you know, you don't have to tell us who, who, but just have you got any in mind that you think, yeah, actually, I'd really love to explore that perspective in a bit more detail or depth? Well, you, 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 um, it's true when you start when you start writing something you, you know you're you're to begin to begin with you feel like you're going to be lucky if you can get one book out of it you know can can you turn this thing into a, into a book and i never i never assume i'm going to have a massive series or anything so sometimes usually i'll get through the through through the first book of it and i'll think actually yeah i've got more to say about this we can make it into a we can make it into a series what could co i think i i knew it was going to be maybe two or three books uh, quite early on and then as I wrote it I thought no no I've, I've got more I can I can make this into quite a long a long series um in terms of future projects um uh I'm, I'm always open to it and I'm always I'm always thinking about it for example um this is my this is my lock nation uh, sort of thing that um I have my I have my uh Lockwood and Co uh the black case book which is the this is the, <laughs> this, is the this is the file that currently has um, sort of ideas for uh, and little fragments of new uh, Lockwood and Co stories, which I've been mm. kind of looking at and working on over the last couple of years. And um, you know, at some at some point, hopefully, we can we can open up the case book and hear hear mm. more about about our our, our friends. But um, uh, the, the case book is making people go a bit insane in the chat right now. Oh, is it? Oh, good. Yeah, it is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. it's, 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 I mean, have you ever? Have you ever, has this prospect ever crossed your mind? I'm, I'm going back to obviously eight year old you creating books with alternative endings and different different paths and directions. Yeah. I'm also thinking of the sort of Dickensian way of how he released a lot of his books in the in the early days in terms of you know they were mm -hmm. released on a weekly basis, different sections, you know, so people could then comment on them and they you could yes. sort of, have you ever considered that as a possibility for maybe even a, a side avenue for one of the characters where you could really have fun with it and it being in such an interactive way in terms of well you know you've got the whole of lock nation here tonight um you know and i'm sure they would love to be involved in that sort of process that's similar to the dickensian sort of way of publishing fiction well you know it's funny, it's funny you say that chris but um I, I i kind of did it a little bit with a with a lockwood i did a lockwood short story some years ago uh called the dagger in the desk which i did i think i did it with the guardian on um online and and it actually i'd forgotten about this but we did we did it the way you said that i i wrote a i wrote a kind of chapter um and then at the end of it i gave the readers um uh, a, a multiple choice of about three different things you know should 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 uh should the heroes go into the into the room uh interrogate somebody or 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 do something else and depending on what the vote was um i had to write the next bit for the next day um and then uh, we did it sort of two or three times so we, we i created that book actually with a with a kind of interactive element um but I've kind of forgotten about it. So, yeah, maybe we'll have to do that sometime. It worked really well. I mean, I really enjoyed doing it. Brilliant. I've got yeah. some more questions, so we'll try and plow through some. Um, apologies for name pronunciations. Anyone who's watched this show a long time, you'll know I'm terrible at them. Um, Aifa, or being Welsh, Aoife, uh, Michael. Um, Jonathan, this is a great question. How do you yeah. know when an idea is good enough to write? And this this relates to a lot of people who want to get into writing. I'm always afraid to start writing because I don't know if it's good enough. Um, well, I don't think I don't think you ever know if an idea is good enough. Um, certainly not before you put it on the page. And I yeah. think you have therefore you have to put it on the page. You 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 you'll never you'll never write anything if you if you're waiting for it to be perfect. Um, uh, you 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 have to just put it down, commit commit to putting it down because you can always change it later. That's that's the beauty of writing that you you it's never it's never set in stone. You can always change it. So you just have to get it down onto the paper and um, then, okay, you you can look at it. Is it good? Well, yes, maybe that bit was good. I'll I'll use that and I'll get rid of the rest. Um, yeah. That that's that's the bottom line. And you and you, but you never know. You, every day as a writer, I'm sure you guys are the same. When you when you sit there with your blank piece of paper, you get that kind of sense of anxiety because like, oh, am I going to be able to fill this page today? Um, 
you, you always have that anxiety, don't you? I mean, I, I think. Um, I, I think, I think, I think uh, you, for me, it was the big a big thing for me was I was writing my my novellas for myself. Like I yeah. wanted to do those stories on the page, and what I thought was, if I like the story, someone else is going to like the story. So if you believe that your story is good to you, someone else will believe that as well. Yeah. So. I think that's the key. Like you said, if it's not down on, on the page, you can't edit it, you can't improve it. Get it down first and then look at maybe beta readers or even a friend or family member just saying, what do you think of it? And have an honest opinion back. Yes. And if that gives you the confidence to take it forward, then fantastic. Yeah, I think absolutely, absolutely right. You you do have to write, you you are writing for yourself. Mm. You, you've got to entertain, you've got to entertain yourself. You've got to got to have fun with it. And then you're you're absolutely right. Other people will hopefully enjoy it as well definitely okay let me keep going through these um okay. i've saved a lot and um this is a question that everybody has been asking all week and i'm sure you don't have a, a, an answer because you probably don't know it's uh from nugget kid again do you ho hope to have a season two i'm assuming they mean on netflix obviously it wasn't renewed which is a big shock to a lot of people especially with uh such support um what do you feel about that? And do you feel like this is ever going to get picked up by someone else as a result? Well, I mean, it, one, one, one never knows. Um, the, 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 the first thing to say is that, you know, Netflix and complete fiction together produced this amazing show, which was absolutely brilliant. I, I don't think anybody could have done it, could have done it better. So in a, in a sense, you know, we've already won with a, with a, with a beautiful show. Yeah. Um, uh, I I think um, it would be lovely if we could find a way to 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 make a second a second series. Um, it's not an easy thing because uh, Netflix own the rights, and so um, that's that's quite a big hurdle that would have okay. to be o overcome. Um, but um, you know, when when you uh, you know, I, I think when we've got a this wonderful fan um, fandom, you know, Lockwood and Co. out there uh, on a daily basis are sort of making Lockwood trend like we were trending today. You know, it's uh, absolutely, absolutely fantastic. And I think if we have um, a community with that passion and that and that love and that creativity, then you know, uh, then, then there's there's always going to be hope. Um, mm. uh, what one one has to just sort of wait and see. Oh, brilliant. It's a, it's a it's a question. Obviously, a lot of people had. Uh, the urge to ask and and that's the kind of answer I expected and it is with you guys that will make that happen above anything else because the support for the show is probably what Netflix looked at early on and I'm amazed that the, the viewership wasn't big enough for them to consider that and I'm sure it's picking up even more um, especially with your getting it trending daily on Twitter yeah, is amazing. absolutely going to help a lot of other people that haven't seen that or heard about it get into that story so you're doing the right things and i think if it's going to happen it's going to be because of the lock nation and well done to you guys for doing that i think yeah so certainly i know that all the guys at complete fiction and uh, certainly um you know me, me as well we, you know we really couldn't be uh more thrilled at the yeah. at the response and, and that the the love that you guys are showing for the show so uh yeah we 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 will we'll wait and see what happens Fantastic. Um, Alex says, uh, how did you come up with a thinking cloth? It's genius. Oh, well, that was that actually was I can't, I can't uh, claim it was me. It was my daughter. Oh, wow. Um, yeah. My daughter, Isabel. Um, when I, when I was writing the first book, I think Isabel was about um, nine. Uh, she was quite little. Um, and what we used to do is as a family, we'd sort of go for, go for like a walk or something and um, we'd tell ghost stories to each other. And I was I was obviously in the zone thinking about ghost stories. Um, and on one of the occasions, Isabel came up with the idea for uh, this 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 cloth, the tablecloth that you would write on. And it would, it would be called it would be called the thinking cloth. And I, I, I instantly <laughs> rushed back to my room as as a true writer does and nicked the idea and and wrote it wrote it down so yeah that was that was isabel's idea so i'm i'm very happy to uh, to blame her for it mm. it's it's really impressive that um the kind of way you've angled this at an age group that is kind of for me between young readers and teenagers but also what adults, adults can enjoy obviously <laughs> but did you kind of feel like it was designed for a certain age group or was it just the case that you wrote what you kind of felt was needed to be said? Because at times there's quite a bit of action, there's, there's ghosts. I mean, as a youngster, one of my most scary things I've seen is the Ghostbusters scene with the lady in the library. 
she <laughs> terrified me. And the similar kind of ghost in, in, in kind of your series in that sense. But did you have an age group in mind when you wrote this story? Um, not, not necessarily an age group, but I, but I, I kind of always, I, I guess I always try to write something that appeal appeals to me now as a, as a, as an adult, but also would have appealed to me when I was, when I was younger. So I, I try and write something that has both, both sort of elements within it. Um, uh, I, I write for the person I was and the person I am now. Um, and so, yeah, you know, I, I, I guess, if I had it, if I had in my head, I, it, it would be a kind of t that sort of 12, 13 teenage up to adult, you know, but pretty much when you get to that age, you can read adult books and mm. all, all the barriers start to break down. Um, uh, yeah. So I was, I was kind of writing for, for a wide, a wide age group. Mm. I've seen a question, Chris, that I'm going to ask if that's all right. Go on, yeah, plenty. Go, go for it. Yeah. So this one in the chat. Oh, fantastic. Question, um, yeah. It's a great question. So it's, what do you think about the neurodivergent um, and autistic community feeling represented by George? Um, so, yeah, I'm yeah, guessing that's, that's more of a general how do you feel about that and, and the representation that you've created and put out there? I, I, I'm, I'm so absolutely thrilled by it. I think, it, I think it's brilliant. I mean, I, um, uh, you know, George... Um, uh, George in, in the show is uh, is is brilliantly uh, portrayed by by Ali, um, uh, and they they really bring out something that was I think latent in the in the, in the books. When I when I wrote George all those years ago, I didn't I didn't sort of sit there thinking that I was trying to make him neurodivergent. It wasn't it wasn't a specific intention. Having said that, the the character and the the the, um, uh, the, the his motivations, the way he talks, the way he thinks. That's kind of what I was doing without 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 realizing it. So uh, when when the guys uh, portrayed it on screen in that in that way, I I almost I, I looked at it and, and with wonder and delight, realizing that that's actually what what George was. So what, what, one of the beauties of the TV show actually is the way that, that all these all these sort of elements are, are are brought in, and it's all part of the sort of the family of of of, of Lockwood and Co. Uh -huh. It must have been amazing to see your characters come to to life on the on the screen as you've written them because what i've got from the audience is that how amazing they felt about how representative uh, represented the book was to the screen yeah. and that's not often the case when it comes to adaptations so did you feel that was justified in your eyes um but coming from the fans they they seem to love that adaptation in that sense but, uh, yeah i mean i i think in in all in all the with all the characters the the the, the guys who, who did the show um Performed a miracle, really, because they kept them true to the to the to the to the figures I'd written in, in the book, yeah. um, but then were kind of free to to sort of add add components and add add add, add subtleties and sort of bring things up to date and and sort of become more inclusive and all all kinds of all kinds of things, basically bringing it into a kind of um, a modern you know making making it more modern than it was um, you know if, if it was just me writing ten years ago. So the, the, that was that was the that was the beauty of the show. Actually, mm. it was it was both incredibly um, faithful, but also had a freedom to, to to change things and to add things and alter things. And um, I, I was blown away by it. I've got I've got a question, and if anyone's seen the thumbnail for this video, please have a look at it because Jonathan, you you're in a photograph on the front of that, right? You stood up. You're wearing a nice jacket and a pair of jeans. Oh yeah. However. In the front of the first book cover, Anthony Lockwood is wearing a very similar jacket and <laughs> outfit almost. Um, <laughs> I, I might have been making this up, but it looks kind of a similar dress sense. Was there any kind of like any element of yourself put into Jonathan Lockwood, Anthony Lockwood, uh, the character? I, 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 well, no, I'm not, <laughs> I'm not sure. <laughs> I'm not sure he shifts uncomfortably. Um, you know, I, <laughs> It, it would be it would be nice to be as uh, swashbuckling as as Anthony Lockwood. I mean, I think I think all my all my three characters actually, all my all my main characters uh, have have elements of of me in them, and that's mm. kind of partly why I love them love them all all so much. Um, you, you know, it's, it, one of the great pleasures of of writing the series was to write it from Lucy's viewpoint. You know, I very much li liked sort of becoming becoming Lucy as much as as much as possible. I did I did experiment with trying to write as Anthony Lockwood in the second book, uh, but it didn't it didn't work. You know, Lucy was the 
was the voice and the perspective that really kind of gave us the proper um, uh, the proper sort of um, means of exploring this world. Um, so in in some ways, there's 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 more of me in her that, than than in than in Anthony. Yeah. Okay, we're we're going to finish up with a couple, uh, one or two more questions and do the giveaway, guys, because we're taking up a lot of Jonathan's time. We appreciate that you want more. We definitely want more. We will have a part two if Jonathan agrees to it, and we'll talk all about the other books that you've mentioned. There's been a lot of questions about those. Um, Nugget Kid, we've had three of your questions on, but oh. you're asking the kind of uh, good ones here that are kind of outside the box. Um, who is your favorite author? I know that's hard to narrow down, but who is one of your favourite authors would be better? That's that's a good question. Um, so it, it kind of depends where, what yeah what sort of what day of the week it is. Um, yeah. Uh, you know, tr growing up traditionally, I I did love um, a uh, I loved the I loved the fantasy writer Jack Vance. He was he was very good. I, lo I loved him as a, as a teenager. He was very influential. Um, uh, Robert Louis Stevenson wrote Treasure Island. Uh, I think uh, that's still kind of the the archetypal sort of classic adventure story which, to which you know I would aspire uh, to, to write. Um, there are plenty of people out there doing wonderful things. You know, um, uh, just recently I've been reading a beautiful graphic novel by um, uh, uh, Andrew Donkin and Owen Colfer, which is dealing with global dealing with um, uh, global warming and, and and guys who are out there doing wonderful creative things um, about things that matter that really matter. You know, I'm. I'm uh, really sort of take my hats off to them. Yeah, amazing. Um, this has been asked multiple times, so I have to ask it, Eleanor. Um, can we have confirmation? This you may not be able to ask this. Answer this: <laughs> that Lockwood and Lucy are in a relationship by the end of Empty Grave. Um, yes, you can have confirmation. I, I, I think um, you know the ending was was obviously really important for me. Um, the the, the different ways the different ways that one could do it and i i kind of felt that by the time you got to the end you know they had earned they, they'd sort of earned that um uh that 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 that, that uh, proximity that closeness but you you kind of it's gonna it's gonna happen out of out of camera shot you know I, I felt like they needed a bit of a bit of privacy so um what i wanted at the end was to kind of feel like they they're at, they're, they are just coming together at that point um and they do so just as they as they leave as they leave the shop, which I which I thought was a nice way of doing it. Um, yeah. yeah. Brilliant. Uh, a lot of happy fans about that. Okay, last one, and then we'll do the giveaway, guys. And thank you so much for your questions. You so many are coming Brilliant. in. Yeah. Um, yeah. We appreciate you so much. Maya B says, what do you think of the support on Twitter, especially the trending hashtags? Well, do you know what? It's been it's been the most um uh special and nourishing thing. You know, the the whole the whole um experience of having the, the tv show was 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 a, was a wonderful thing and um what's what's sort of come out from that has been this 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 tremendous um community uh, on on twitter on on um other social media as as well um and you know it's it's uh, it, it is a kind of solitary business writing and I actually feel that there's this love and and um uh and and passion out there um is is something that, that gives me strength every day. I, I come in here and I, I keep writing away, um, and um, I'm very grateful to all you guys for 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 all the the time and, and energy you're putting into uh, supporting the show. So thank you all very much. Yeah, mm. amazing guys. Please do keep supporting in that sense, and please keep uh, hashtagging all about Lockwood and season two because I want it as well. Let's get it out there, but uh, everybody, and um, I'm sure. I'm sure with the support is going to happen. I, well, I hope so. But Jonathan, um, we're we're an hour and a half, half an hour extra show just for you guys. And thank you, Jonathan, for doing that. Oh, and I'm pleasure. sure if you're happy to, we'll definitely get you back on and talk about your other books as well. Um, but before we do, let's do this giveaway. Oh, yeah. Um, I'll give you guys a couple of more seconds to put Portland Row in the chat if you haven't already done so to win a signed copy of one of Jonathan's Lockwood books. Um, which will be incredible to put on your shelf and talk about to all your um, Lockwood fans and friends. Um, so please put Portland Row in the chat if you haven't done that yet. Um, but what I'll ask, whilst these comments are coming in, where can people find your work and more about you? Um, so, well, in your local library or your local your local 
bookstore. Um, uh, if you want to find out more about me, there's my uh, jonathanstroud.com website. Um, and essentially following me on Twitter or Instagram or Facebook, um, uh, you'll get the latest bits of news about what I'm up to. And um, I certainly hopefully that there'll be lots of uh, events coming up over the next few months. And uh, I'll get a chance to meet some of you guys um, in the UK and and beyond. As, mm. In terms of live events, um, Jonathan, have you yeah. ever had an interesting encounter? Um, I've had some absolutely amazing encounters. Yeah, yeah ab ab absolutely. Um, uh, I mean, one one that one that I'll, I'll never forget was when I was in America uh, for one of the. I can't remember if it was a Lockwood book, it, but it was a long time ago, and I was I was I was I was doing my signing, um, and there was a queue of people, and there was a guy in the queue, and he he, he kind of came up, um, and he um, uh, so I got chatting to him as I was signing his books, and he said that he was a um, uh, he was in he was in the American Army, and he uh, was just back from a a tour of Afghanistan, and he said that he uh, that it had been really difficult, and that while he was out there. Um, he had had my my one of my books wow. with him, and he used to sort of come back to the base at the end of a of a grueling day, seeing terrible things, and he'd come back and he would sort of lose himself in the book, and he yeah. just wanted to come and uh, and thank me for that. And that I I found that a tremendously powerful mm. uh, powerful experience. Um, it, you know, it is the, it's the, the power. power of books yeah, and, the power yeah. of reading is escapism, and and that is. A prime example of in the worst scenario is to be able to come and read your books and be lost yeah. in the world in the best sense. Yeah, it's incredible. That's no, that, was, that was that was very 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 special. Yeah. yeah, 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 definitely. I mean, talking about things that are special, tonight's show has been very special. And before we do the giveaway, if you're watching now and you've enjoyed this interview with Jonathan, then please share it around so other other Lockwood um, members and Lock Nation members can um, enjoy the the things that Jonathan's talked about, especially the confirmation, because the chat went absolutely crazy um, <laughs> <laughs> when that happened. So it'd be good for it people is, yeah. to be able to see yep. uh, um, that moment. For, for 100, Jonathan, 160 so. odd people watching this. Please hit the like button. I'm sure you can get that up to 160 um, and subscribe if you haven't done so. I'm sure you have. Um, thank you so much, everybody. But let's do this giveaway because I'm sure someone wants to know who's going to be the lucky person. We've got 98 people in there in the competition. Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to press draw. It's going to spin around the lots of names, and whoever wins this, we will sort out between myself, uh, Chris, um, Jonathan, and Georgia. We'll get that book out to you, I'm sure. Um, good luck, everybody. Here we go. Let's see who's going to win this. <gasps> That's exciting. Okay, um, wow. We're in there. Amazing. We're in there, but we can't win it. Um, the winner is Dia Diana. I was going to say Diana. Diana. That's not even a name. <laughs> 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 uh, D Diana, oh my god, Diana, Diana or Diana, whoever you are, fantastic. Um, oh, great, yes. there you go. Please contact us, the writing community chat show at gmail.com or drop us a message on Twitter, whatever you want to do, get in touch with us and we'll sort that out. Um, yeah, people are recognizing the her in the chat, so yes, thank oh, you so cool. much. Yeah, congratulations to you. Um, what, what are they? Um, great interview, thank you so much. No, thank you guys, honestly, oh, thank you for yeah. tuning in. And giving your questions jonathan thank you for spending your friday night with us and oh, for an extra pleasure. half an hour uh, you've been absolutely wonderful and we would we would certainly have you back on for a talk about your other books because we've hardly touched the surface i feel um but yeah <laughs> no, thank you both, both very much it's been a real real delight brilliant chris anything else before we finish this up uh, no, just if you've enjoyed today's show with Jonathan, uh, then please check us out next week. We'll still be here on Friday talking to another brilliant author. You know, season 12 has just started. We're here every Friday at the same time. Um, so, yeah, come and join in in the chat. Come and have a chat with us and come and get some great writing advice. And for, for, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I was on a roll then as well for some brilliant <laughs> authors. Um, just like Jonathan, um, yeah. you know, we get great advice from all the guests that come on the show. And, you know, it's part of the joy of doing the show is that we get to speak to brilliant authors that give us little nuggets of advice that help us all be better. And, you know, it's a community within itself, uh, the writing community, and it's, you know, a joy to be a part of it. So thank you. And if you've enjoyed it, then please check us out again. Well, thank you so much, Jonathan. It's been an absolute pleasure to chat oh, to you. No, no, thanks, guys. Yeah, thank you, everybody. Lovely. Yep. Take care. See you soon. Uh, stay safe, have a great week, and enjoy the lovely British weather if you're in Britain. <laughs> thanks, guys. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye. -bye. Bye.